I want to draw your attention to today is that of Ignatius Loyola, insofar as he needs any attention drawn to him. Again, like a lot of these saints, Ignatius is a remarkable personality. And the tragedy is that he is so relevant to our modern age, and yet I'd say most Catholics wouldn't know much about him or see the relevance. Ignatius could certainly have identified with today's youth. Maybe there are qualities that are eternally of youth. He was a vain young man. He was a young nobleman, Basque, came of a noble family, young soldier, officer, very badly wounded at a siege after fighting very bravely. A cannonball struck his knees, was carried home to the family castle, and his leg was set. The medicine at the time was comparatively primitive. It was set in such a way that it would be quite crooked. And in those days, men wore tights. And Ignatius was a young ladies' man, and he was appalled because a man needed a good leg. And the story goes that he made them break it again and stretch him on a rack. It's amazing that he survived it, given how primitive surgery was at the time. And he walked forever after with a limp. He was a touchy, violent young man. And by the way, Teresa of Avila, that other great saint, she was to complain bitterly about the young Spanish nobility, who she said would start a duel. They'd start a fight uh, with each other over the slightest imagined insult. And that was Ignatius. He was fiery, hot-tempered. He was lying on his back, recuperating, and had nothing to do. He loved to read romances, but there were no romances in the castle. What they did have were religious books, and so he was stuck with reading religious books. And somehow, in the course of reading, he was converted. And he started to read the scriptures, underlining the words of our Lord in red and anything to do with Our Lady in blue. If you talk to people who've been converted like this, ultimately they can't explain it. But as one historian has observed, you can psychoanalyze this all you want. Dashing young nobleman, now he's going to be crippled, so naturally he turns to God, you turn to God when you're crippled, you turn to God when you're in trouble, whatever. The comment of this historian was really, that can only go so far. At the end of the day, a decision to fight for the heavenly king and queen is a decision to fight for the heavenly king and queen. And that's what Ignatius decided. He took all of the chivalry and the language of courtly love and of adventure and service to royalty and he transferred it to God. And finally, he made a terrifying retreat in a cave in a place called Manresa, which is famous in the lore of his followers' sense. You know, he really went to extremes in the cave, okay? He really went to extremes. But it'll show you, even after his conversion, how far he was from God, in the sense that on the way he fell into conversation with a Moor. We tend to forget that Ignatius was born about the end of the 15th century, and the south of Spain had been Muslim uh, up until just a while before. And he fell into conversation with a moor on the road. And the moor passed some remark that Ignatius thought was derogatory of Our Lady. And anyway, they parted after a row. But Ignatius later on thought, I should have stabbed him. Because that was what one did. So he went back. He doubled back to find the moor to give him a good stab. That was Ignatius. He really did like a, a decent bit of steel and, and a good edge on it. And, and that was your young Spanish nobleman at the time. Anyway, onto the cave in Manresa, he starved himself. He fasted, he prayed, he committed tremendous austerities. He grew a big, long, straggly beard, the whole bit. Now, Ignatius later, and this is a kind of a, a pattern in the lives of the saints. I think Francis was the same way. Ignatius later repented of his extremes. He was young and he felt, uh, yeah, you know, that mightn't be the way to do it. But he had visions in the cave, uh, all the rest of it, and finally he ended up with this purified, clarified commitment to serve the heavenly king and queen.
as a knight of the eternal chivalric order, if you like. Now, another uh, scholar, a Protestant scholar, remarked with considerable reserve that he emerged from the cave the cold master of religious affect. Well, whichever one you take, Ignatius emerged from the cave and was to become a master of the spiritual life. He had to get an education. He went to a schoolmaster. He had no Latin or very little. He gave the schoolmaster the stick and he told him not to stop using it until he had learned the Latin. He was in his 30s and it's not easy to start learning at that age. He ended up at the College, I think at the College de Montaigu in Paris, which was famous for flogging its students. In university in those days, they beat you just as enthusiastically as they beat you in school. There was a great consistency in those days to education. And the Collège de Montaigu was infamous for it. Anyway, he got through it. I think there's a story that John Calvin may have been there at the same time. Certainly, he went to the same college. And he ended up founding what he called the Company of Jesus, the Society of Jesus. Basically... You're really going to raise an eyebrow at this, okay? But I'm trying to explain how he was thinking. These were the drinking companions of Jesus. These were the lads, the crowd, the set of Jesus, the entourage, the Jesus gang. And they became known partly for short, partly through from derision as the Jesuits. Philip II of Spain was later to comment, oh, he said, I knew Ignatius when he used to beg around Madrid. And it's true that Ignatius really put himself through the ringer, humiliating himself in every possible way as he became this tempered Spanish sword, this sword of Spanish steel in the hands of the Lord against evil made by a master craftsman in the forge of God. The order, the Jesuits, he attracted some of the most brilliant people around him. Francis Xavier is just one example. It would take five or six episodes to even decently touch on his achievements. The order quickly turned out to be an incredible instrument in the hands of the church. Not only did they have the normal three vows, poverty, chastity and obedience, But they later added a fourth vow of blind obedience to the Pope in all matters of mission. They attracted the most brilliant men. They went all over the world. They achieved incredible things for the church. They were poets, writers, theologians, architects, engineers, doctors. You name it, the Jesuits produced it. And if I mention theologians well down the line, that would be something that even their contemporaries levelled at them, is that they were worldly. But Ignatius' idea was, because he was central to what is called the Counter-Reformation, but what I would really call the Catholic Reformation, Ignatius' idea was to send men into the world who had been so forged and so tempered that they could operate independently for years, even if they got lost and nobody could found them, and keep preaching the gospel and serving the King and Queen of Heaven. The Jesuits was a remarkable contribution to the life of the church. They've been controversial from the first. They remain controversial. We have at the moment, we have the first Jesuit Pope in the entire history of the church. Ignatius, the Basque soldier. If you ever want to see an absolutely gorgeous statue of him, go into the church where he's buried, the Jesu, which literally means the Jesus Church, in a mystical trance wearing the mass vestments. Ignatius soldiers on in heaven, still serving the church. And so at this time, when above all, we need soldiers, we need those who know how to fight, and who know how to fight with their heads as well as with their hearts and their hands. We pray today to Ignatius, Saint Ignatius, prefers. <laughs>